guys. Thank you very much. It's obviously always a challenge to talk after, after Tom, <laughs> who elegantly <laughs> draws a line from more than 70 years ago, I think it was 45 when, uh, say, the paper from von Neumann was published, till, say, 10 years in the future. This talk is really completely down to the earth, much more boring, so I think the best, best thing to do right now is just to admit it from the very beginning. So it's talking about, say, an ambition which, um, say, a project, um, which say an, a, a, a number of supercomputing centers um, are now say preparing, and I hope that we can say also formally start off uh, say very soon. Um, and it's about something which we call uh, Phoenix, um, which is about say trying to basically aggregate say infrastructures and to augment infrastructures, which are partially already in, in place at the involved uh, supercomputing centers. And it's about to, say, establish HPC and data infrastructure services for multiple research communities. So it's really, and that's something which I want to explain to you, and I think it's also an invitation then also to this specific community, which is, say, at this conference, um, to engage with us is um, to, say, work with us also in building up this, this infrastructure because it's meant uh, to actually support uh, communities and we want to do it in a, in a way that we actually say facilitate federation of um, the infrastructure at different locations here around around Europe. Now as I said I mean it's really meant to be a science community driven approach and actually and that's why I put the logo here it's the human brain project which is for say one important reason say going to be the main driver um, it just for the simple reason is that it's we expect to get the money for getting going from actually uh, exactly this project. So that's why this project is in the primary uh, seat, but it's also say about trying to involve other communities. Um, so in order to realize this infrastructure and to first enhance this infrastructure really in a co-design approach. So to try to understand what are the needs of the different um, uh, communities. It is about trying also to establish a new kind of, of model where say, science communities can buy into an infrastructure um, such that we as Phoenix resource providers say act then as uh, say service providers who provide IT infrastructures to science communities but that of course also means that the communities have to get control on the way of how these resources are actually uh, provisioned then to the community. So the resource allocation is actually managed by the communities and that <laughs> is something which we also try to establish within um, this, this project. Now just also I will explain it a bit more detail later, I mean just to already highlight at the very beginning, say there's some things which we try to do different than what you can, as of today, uh, expect from a supercomputing uh, infrastructure is that we want to add, say, more interactivity. Um, we want also to add, uh, say, the ability, I mean, to do a more elastic uh, provisioning of scalable computing resources. And then the third point is, say, the federation of the data infrastructure. Now, I put here a disclaimer. I mean, we are still, say, very much at the beginning, so a lot of it is actually still open to, uh, say, final architectural uh, decisions, but this is on purpose because, as already stressed, we really want to do it, uh, say, with uh, the right science communities. We don't want to just put something in place and then uh, hope for everybody to become happy. Now, who are the players which are involved in there? Um, it are, say, five supercomputing centers. Uh, it's in uh, Barcelona, BSC, in France, CEA. Um, then here in Italy, in Bologna, uh, Ginica, CSCS in Switzerland, and uh, then in Germany, it's the Uli Supercomputing Center. So it's all sites um, which are, say, provisioning uh, tier zero resources within uh, praise. And I think also what all these sites have in common that they are quite strongly linked then to different uh, science communities. So really something which I at least personally also believe to be extremely important. Now this is not meant to be a closed shop, so I mean we actually also envisage that in future uh, this consortium might actually expand. Now what are the kind of research communities which we are talking about? Um, well, first of all, 
just also from, that's where we get our money from, it's uh, the brain research, or the more specifically human brain uh, project, um, which comes with its needs for being able, as already mentioned also by Tom, I mean the uh, scalable uh, uh, simulations of brain models, but actually at the same time, um, and that shows also the diversity in this uh, research community, um, it comes with quite uh, some challenging data analytics requirements when it's about analyzing, uh, for instance, brain images in order to reconstruct them, um, high resolution three-dimensional atlases of, of the brain. Um, I think also one interesting aspect, and that's also where you see that the community is trying to say have really a collaborative approach, is to build up an, a knowledge base um, as part of what they called in uh, the neuroinformatics platform. Now, there are some other say communities which I, we believe that uh, are say prime candidate of also being say. Um, say, good users uh, of, of this infrastructure, um, that is material science. Also there we have, say, large data sets which are coming from simulations, but also from, say, experiments. And I think, um, obviously, there is a European community which is already engaged towards uh, enabling data sharing um, within, for instance, the, the uh, different centers of, of excellence there. Um, then the area of genomics um, and also the area of physical science experiments where we have, say, some experiments which do have, for instance, also the need of bringing not only, say, a lot of, of data and being able to process it, but also to combine it uh, with, uh, say, HPC simulations. So it's really about, say, communities um, which have in common that um, they, at least most of them, um, have the challenge that they produce data from quite different types of sources. It could be an HPC system itself. It could be also, say, different experiments like, uh, say, high-performance uh, scanners of, of images. So you have distributed data sources and you have also, say, a certain level of heterogeneity. Um, and you have the need of having a close connection to HPC systems where the HPC systems act as a source or a sink of, of the data. Um, so, from this we would conclude that uh, there is a need for an infrastructure to facilitate data sharing and to uh, connect it to a high performance uh, uh, data processing capabilities and that is something which typically most of the uh, infrastructures which we have at least in place in Europe um, don't provide. So, I mean, many of the supercomputing centers are, for instance, involved, say, in any kind of grid computing, but if you look closer in the center and uh, Yuli is not an exception. I mean, it's basically just one server where you can uh, copy data by hand from one world into the other. So there is not really a tight integration of a federated data infrastructure and the HPC. Now, how do we want to address it also, say, from a more architectural or conceptual perspective? And I think there's also, say, an important change in, in the way of how we want to set up things in, say, really provisioning of resources in a service-oriented manner. So to really, say, also separate, uh, say, concerns and to, and our role as Phoenix resource providers is to really focus on infrastructure services which are suitable for uh, the different science communities. So we cannot afford it to just do it for one single uh, science community. And that's why we also position this project even so initially the main money comes from one specific community in a way that we can expand it also to other communities. And then we expect then these communities on top of these infrastructure services to come up with their own community specific uh, platforms. And now talking here to, for instance, um, a, a material science community, for instance, something like AIDA is a good example for having, say, a platform which is community specific, which can run on top of such kind of infrastructure uh, services. Then we want to federate these, these infrastructures um, for different reasons. I mean, it helps to enhance the availability of the infrastructure service. It also broadens, say, uh, the, uh, the kind of services which are, say, available, because we don't expect at each site the same kind of computers to be available. Um, but it also allows, for instance, to optimize for data locality. So, I mean, for some of the data sources, I, uh, I was mentioning, for instance, um, uh, what we and Jullich are doing in the context of, uh, say, uh, creating of brain atlases, we're also talking here about petabytes of data. Um, and so you don't want to move this kind of this amount of data uh, all over Europe, uh, but ideally you keep this data locally, and then you allow others to actually use local services in order to uh, access this data. Now, 
a lot of this aspect, of course, is strongly inspired what is in the, in the cloud. But I think it's also important to realize that there are some things where it's still, say, different from the cloud. So it's not us turning into, say, um, uh, say cloud providers like, like Amazon. Um, I mean, we are aiming for, say, a very limited level of uh, virtualization so that you can really get uh, the resources which, which you need. And it's also, I think, largely about the different types of, of business model in terms of that we will charge for provisioning of capabilities um, of IT infrastructure, not so much in terms of the actual consumption of these resources. Right? So there's a big difference in there, because if we would say basically uh, charge according to, say, consumption, uh, then we would have to charge at a much higher rate. But we just say, okay, we provision a certain capability to you, and it's up to then the community to actually use that. Um, for the sake of time, let me just um, immediately jump into the kind of services which we plan to provision in, in this context. It starts with, say, computing services, where, as already mentioned, we will add interactive uh, computing services. Um, then, of course, there is also scalable computing services. But if you think about, in, for instance, uh, say, solutions like AIDA, where you have an AIDA daemon, you need somewhere, uh, say, a uh, the opportunity also to have a service which is continuously running. So you need, uh, say, VM services stands for, say, virtual machine services. Then there is different kind of data services, and of course you have to embed it into an authentication and authorization services. Uh, you have to manage users, etc. So let me go in for some of these services in a little bit more more detail. For, say, the interactivity, um, and that's something where we have seen, say, the, the brain community driving it a bit, not necessarily it, to the extent we initially expected it, um, but um, they are still, say, pursuing it, and we see it also emerging in, in other areas, and that is the need for being able to actually couple uh, to scalable simulations in an interactive way. And in a way that you say, monitor the progress of the simulations, but also in a way that you interact with the simulations. Um, and that could just mean of being able to interrupt a simulation uh, on the fly when you just notice, okay, the simulation is moving in the wrong direction. It is not exhibiting the kind of uh, properties which you would ex ex expect. Um, but also we see here, uh, say, the stronger need for being able to uh, interactively process the data, so to have basically the ability to log into the system and to have access to, to all the data, and to have then also the ability to use um, interactive frameworks like Jupyter Netbooks um, R, or maybe also MATLAB or Octave. Now, the second type of services is, uh, say, the scalable computing services. Um, and one thing where we really want to say expand as there as we see some use cases in the context of the the brain research but that's where we actually still more on a searching part um, and that's about say elastic uh, scalable computing services and there are different options of how to actually implement that i mean you could think about having a kind of a checkpoint resume mechanisms where you say okay there's some long-running simulations we don't care about uh, say so much on when they finish, so you checkpoint it in order to free up resources and then allow for an interactive um, job to quickly scale out um, for, uh, say, a larger job. The other alternative is also to, say, reserve essentially a set of nodes for these kind of um, calculations. So, what we see, for instance, in the, in the brain is, is in the brain as people are interested in uh, coupling simulations with uh, neurorobotics experiments. So where you start to have some real-time requirements and you don't want to submit a, a job to the batch queuing system and the batch queuing system in its wisdom, I mean, schedules then uh, the simulation at uh, 2 a.m. in the night um, when you're not ready to do your uh, robotics experiment. Now, this is, say, one example, and that's the reason why I explain it here, where we are really, say, open also for, say, co-design in order to understand what are, say, the needs. Uh, so what is basically the upper limit for acceptable response times? Are you willing, I mean, to only wait for minutes? Or are you, say, willing, I mean, to wait for half an hour or an hour until the resources are made available? And in what range should we be able to scale? Um, now, also, there is in the area of the way of how we want to provision, uh, say, data resources, where we want to do uh, some of the things uh, differently, and I will explain the reasons why. Um, we plan this infrastructure to actually differentiate between different types of, of storage. And uh, 
The terminology which we are currently using is um, that we distinguish between so-called archival data repositories and active data repositories, and possibly upload buffers, but let's focus on the first two. Archival data repositories are meant to store data for a long time. They are optimized for being extremely reliable. They are optimized for capacity because that's where, I say, the primary data uh, products are, I say, accumulated. Um, but they might not necessarily be particularly good in terms of um, the performance at which you can access them. Uh, in particular, if we talk about, say, highly scalable from highly scalable compute systems. On the other hand, um, we want to have, say, active data repositories, um, which I say data repositories we actually um, put in the vicinity of uh, computational but also visualization resources, because for visualization you need to have short ac uh, access latencies um, for uh, um, when you access uh, the data. And these repositories we uh, say foresee being used for uh, storing temporary uh, slave replica of uh, large data objects. Now, the reason for that is actually, if you look at the kind of, say, storage technologies, um, there's basically, uh, you could see, say, two areas. And on the one hand, you have the, say, the technologies uh, to which we are used to in the context of HPC, uh, so that are highly scalable parallel file systems, uh, which have proven to be able to, to cope uh, with, uh, say, 10,000 or even hundreds of thousands of, of clients. Um, and they all, uh, say, have in common that they are basically focused on having a POSIX or almost uh, POSIX compliant uh, interface. On the other hand, if you look more, say, in federated architectures like, say, cloud architectures, um, there are different kinds of, of solutions which are uh, being used. Um, and they are, uh, say, much more flexible. Um, they also um, make it much more easier, I mean, to uh, federate them as they, for instance, support uh, federated identities. Um, but they are not suitable for, say, accessing them from a very highly scalable system. And in order to basically take the best features from both of the worlds, I mean, the kind of architecture which we're implementing is that, say, on the one hand, we have um, archival data repositories, uh, which are based on these kind of cloud technologies, so which are then going to be federated. Uh, so that's why they are based on technologies which are suitable for a federation. Uh, but on the other hand, we have active data repositories, which are continue to be based also, not excluded, but also on these uh, parallel file systems, and through which you then can access them, the data uh, with, say, scalable compute services. And of course, you need then to put services in place, we call them data movers, which allow them to move data back and forth from uh, these slower uh, but federated uh, data uh, stores into, say, the active data stores. Um, now, all of them, of course, needs to be integrated into one AI infrastructure, and that's something which is also say, not, not trivial, but it's, it's necessary so that you have your same ID which you can use um, to access resources either at BSC in, in Barcelona or at Jülich in, in, in Germany. Um, and so there's quite a lot of technicalities around it, I mean, to make sure that you have on the one hand, say, uh, you enable the community to actually obtain these kind of IDs, but on the other hand, also, say, security requirements are taken into account. Now, let me at the end um, take you through also one of the aspects which I highlighted at the very beginning, and that is the way of how we envisage the resource allocation. Now, what we have here is basically we're talking about three different um, actors. So on the one hand, we have those which are currently, say, part of the Phoenix Consortium that are, say, the resource providers, so those who provision uh, compute resources, storage resources. And then we have Phoenix communities, so that are science communities uh, which, say, have a buy-in into this infrastructure, so they are eligible to, uh, say, consume resources there. And members of these communities, we call them the Phoenix users. Now, the role then is, is that the the resource providers, obviously, they provide the resources for a given period of time to the Phoenix communities based on, say, the agreements which are in place. And they also define the rules according to which uh, the resource is allocated. But they don't do the allocation itself because at the, it's the communities which, say, provision the resources for realizing the infrastructure. And so it's up to the communities to actually do the decision on how the resources are distributed, and the way of how we uh, foresee doing this 
Uh, this being done is that the Phoenix user, they submit to their community a proposal for resources, and it's then the community which then uh, reviews the proposal and then awards the available resources to the Phoenix users. So it's the resource provider which only defines rules, and that is say, one of the rules that there is a kind of a peer review process in place to make sure that say, resources are distributed according to scientific excellence, but at the end, it's the community which makes a decision. And for this, we also say, um, and I only want to briefly uh, mention it, uh, we have, say, defined a concept. Um, we call it, say, Phoenix Credits. That's a way of how we express the resources which are available in this infrastructure and which we then can provision then to a science community or Phoenix community, and then the Phoenix community can distribute then uh, these credits according to the rules which have been defined beforehand. So, um, to briefly summarize, um, what we uh, really would like to have is uh, to have, uh, say, strong science drivers towards the data-oriented federated uh, HPC infrastructures. Um, there's quite a lot of opportunities, but also, say, quite some challenges which we have to, to solve in this context, like uh, putting an AI in, in, uh, in place to also uh, bridge between process and cloud storage uh, technologies, um, the integration of interactive um, computing uh, services, and also to establish really a new model for allocating HPC and uh, data resources to research communities. And uh, we try to do that in, in Phoenix. We, Phoenix is a group of uh, supercomputing uh, centers, and they are currently now engaging in a very first project. It has a bit of a clumsy name, HBP SGA. Um, so it's a special research grant under the framework partnership agreement of the Human Brain Project. Um, and it's called then uh, IC, which stands for Interactive Computing E Infrastructure. Um, and, but it's not only, say, for the uh, brain research community, it's also for a wider community, so part of the resource will actually provisioned, be provisioned uh, through uh, praise, and that's where we have some, say, openness then also already now to invite other communities to engage in this. And uh, I just would finally like to give credits to now a growing number of colleagues at the different uh, sites which are involved in that. Thank you very much. So thank you.